Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, May 1st, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. And I'm Rob Dew. Here's a look at what's coming up. Tonight, a prisoner who shared the police transport van with Freddie Gray says that Freddie was trying to injure himself. I'm kicking my ass! Meanwhile, the New York Post is reporting that the police van made a mystery stop before heading to the precinct. Plus, what do Al Sharpton, the mayor of Baltimore, and Barack Obama all have in common? Well, they want to federalize the nation's police. That can't be good. All that plus more coming up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Six officers were charged today in the Freddie Gray case after a state medical examiner's report determined the cause of death was homicide. And now the state's attorney has also said that the arrest itself was illegal. The cops never found any probable cause for his arrest. The officers are now facing up to 20 years in prison, and the driver could face up to 63 years in prison. So, you know, obviously this is a Pretty quickly, this kind of turned around. The state's attorney said she was definitely going to give these people some justice, and very quickly she did that. Yesterday, well, and, we saw the police we'll turn it over that, to her. Because so. she actually has ties with the police department. Yes, uh, her mother, father, aunts and uncles. Uh, but she seemed to be pretty determined to bring some justice here in this case and to not, you know, that might be something that really good. We need someone on the inside to sort of sweep away that thin blue line of protection that they've been sort of experiencing and enjoying mm -hmm. for decades. Now, yesterday there was an article that came out from the Washington Post, and it was right before the police actually came out and made their announcement that they had concluded their investigation. Uh, this report was saying that a prisoner who was sharing a police transport van with Freddie Gray told investigators that he could hear Gray banging against the walls and so basically saying that Freddie Gray was trying to injure himself and they just took this and ran with it. It sounds like it was spun to indicate that, not that <laughs> that's what the guy really said, because he's come out since then and given interviews and say, no, I wasn't trying to say that. I'm in fear for my life now yeah. because of, of how this is coming out and what really happened. Because if you look where there's a metal partition dividing the the two prisoners where they right. were there. So he couldn't really see what was he going on. He couldn't see him at all. So there, right. that's just him taking a guess as to what's going on. That'll never hold up in court. That's that's not a credible witness. But there were some other uh, details in the report as well that were just kind of sketchy. Uh, they were given the a document under the condition the prisoner wouldn't be named. They said he feared for his, his safety. The document written by a Baltimore police investigator uh, it also says it wasn't clear whether there was any other additional evidence to back up this person's version of events. And according to multiple law enforcement sources, <laughs> there it is, we've investigated mm -hmm. ourselves, and they said there's no evidence that his fatal injuries were caused during his videotaped arrest and interaction with police officers. This is according to multiple law enforcement officers. So right. now, like you said, uh, then the police kind of rolled this out yesterday and they said, this is what we found in our report. And they never, they, they mentioned that there was a fourth stop that was never recorded. They never even uh, reported this to investigators. 30 people they talked to. There was about 30 people who the investigators talked to. They never once mentioned this mystery fourth stop. It was only revealed later because of some private surveillance footage that showed that they made this additional stop that they had never reported. So now we're supposed to believe these 30 people's testimony about what happened? Right, and these are the same cops that came out and said, uh, there's a fire over here started by criminals, and it turned out it was started by their tear right. gas grenade earlier in the week. Yeah. And also the ones that said, we have credible sources that the Crips and the Bloods are coming together to try and kill us, and the Crips and Bloods responded and said, no, we're coming together to try to stop and, and protect our communities. And what was interesting, we. I played that video with Darren a few nights ago. Those seem like they were older boys in their uh, mid to upper 20s. And if you look at most crime, I think it's like 70 to 75 to 80% of all like aggravated crime and stuff like that is done by 18 to 23 year olds. Right. So it's the real, it's the young kids that, that need to be schooled a little bit. And so the older guys were coming together to school these kids like, don't be doing this. Don't, don't riot. Don't do all this stuff. Right. And but that's what you're going to get. You're, they've been bred on this whole philosophy of we have to 
fight back. We have to burn things down anytime we don't agree with what the cops do. And then eventually they grow out of that. But I'm, but that's where most of the blame, I think, is in that and out-of-towners coming in and trying to stir stuff up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm not going to excuse anyone rioting and burning things down and getting into criminal activity and stuff like that. But, you know, let's not even talk about how the IRS is constantly looting or corporations are lo looting the environment and, and everything. So why don't people get mad about that? You know, here these people are getting angry because the cops are basically saying that this man severed his own spine, crushed his own larynx, broke his own leg, just beat himself up. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, don't we? <laughs> Don't well, we have some surveillance footage of him beating yeah, himself Yeah, we up? put out this uh, satire footage of what, because they don't have any cameras in the cars, which is, I think, very odd. Why would you not have cameras in there to see what prisoners are doing? But we put out some uh, surveillance footage that, of course, it's satire, but this is kind of what, from the, from the perspective of what the cops are saying, this is what he did to himself. So let's go to that right now. All Adam Shifting at Sousa C Channel, Adam Shifting C4, Adam 92205. 13 and 14. All right, we are not going to 10 for um, one person who's just wanting another. That boy leg looks gross! Pistol in the block. So obviously ridiculous there, yeah. and we just kind of put that out to show how silly it is to say that this man is back there doing that. I mean, <sighs> so crazy things have happened. Who knows? Maybe he really was, but now the the, the witness who was in the van or the semi-witness, he could only hear. He doesn't know what he was actually hearing. Uh, he says that he he did hear some banging on the walls, uh, but the key part is he he couldn't see. There was a metal partition. He had no idea what was going on. And according to the reporter, when the police did eventually seek treatment for Gray, the paramedics who arrived thought that they were being dispatched to treat a broken arm. So they didn't realize that they were coming to the, the, the police station to bring him back from not having a pulse. Right. So even there, they're, they're not being forced. And they broke right. his leg. They didn't even break his arm. Yeah. So. Yeah, so in all kinds of things, video. and then I think that's one of the things <clears throat> that they're being charged with is failure to render aid, and that's something that I uh, everyone can agree on that that they failed there. Now Al Sharpton, the huge race baiting government pimp, Al Sharpton has come out demanding that um, the Justice Department step in, take over policing in the country. That's exactly what I said on Tuesday. But this is what it's all about. That is why Al Sharpton is in the position he's in, because he owes yep. millions of dollars to the IRS, and this is his way of paying that back. Yeah, paying is by his being that mouthpiece to, to to call for more government intervention, which is what always happens. Yep. Oh, we need more government intervention. The problem gets worse when there's more government intervention. That's the whole problem with with Baltimore, yeah. is that they've been running there with really liberal policies that have not trickled down to the citizens. It's just all the cronyism they've been filling their own pockets. So now Sharpton comes in and says, the answer to this is even more government. But we got to federalize the police department and also have to fight states' rights. So he wants to do away with states' rights, federalize the police. Um, and, you know, obviously it doesn't take a genius to point out the fact that it's the feds who have been militarizing the police in the first place. They're the ones who have been giving them all the MRAPs and the machinery and uh, you know the war machines that on the streets. And I'm surprised uh, Reverend Sharpton didn't hold up the Rand Corporation plan for, <laughs> which tells you what we have to do is militarize the police. Essentially, that's right. what the plan is all about. Yeah, well, that the Obama administration. This is something that was started in the Clinton era, and mm -hmm. he has just taken it and run with it. Uh, but it's the Task Force on 21st Century Policing that imposes federal standards on state and local police. Obviously, they want to get that money, get those machinery, that MRAPs. Uh, but here's the thing. It's almost like 
they know that the police departments are going to be their own undoing. They, it's like, here, we're gonna give you these toys to play mm -hmm. with that you're not even trained for and that really have no place on the streets of America. And then all the citizens are gonna get really upset with you and now, they're going to demand a change. Yeah. And, oh, and they don't own that. They don't own those military weapons. They're borrowing them. They're borrowing them and maintaining the MRAPs. So they're already all positioned in place. And so it's kind of super convenient when things like Jade Helm and everything pop off. They're like, oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, so it's, it's just super convenient because all this equipment is now staged all over the country. The military can swoop in at any time and reclaim it. Right, like a Jade Helm type scenario. And speaking of that, we're gonna have a report from Alex at the end of the show. Uh, he's gonna do a big breakdown of Jade Helm. We had an interesting caller today talking about the logo and with, with the shoe in the middle that kind of looked like a, a graphic screw up, mm -hmm. but it actually does look like a shoe when you really look at it like that. So we have that. We've got an, a, an amazing interview with David Knight coming up with some nurses who are against forced vaccinations. And then we have some vaccine propaganda as well with the new Netflix movie, Daredevil, or uh, the TV series, and then with some other different sources of, uh, of media out there where they're really yeah. just pushing it in our faces that we're crazy if we don't just bow down and take everything the government you know, doesn't, wants to inject into us if we don't just take it. Willingly. Right, yeah. and that's what it's all about here. It's not about us telling you to rise up and, and two arms, two arms. It's about exposing this, shining a light on it, and letting, letting them know that we're holding them accountable. It's not about even doing anything else about that other than shining a light on this tyranny so that it they have to dismantle their programs. Now, now we have a report from John Bowne. We've got a little uh, justice being served in Baltimore, but what's about to happen to the rest of America? It seems like we're getting ready for a uh, United Nations intervention. Are you all telling us that the arresting officers covered up or lied about stopping that police van after Freddie Gray was inside the vehicle? So what I will tell you is that we have stated from the beginning when we have information that we're able to share, we will. And as the commissioner said today, it would be inappropriate for us to further comment on the status of the investigation. The sources are saying that Freddie Gray died as a result of slamming his head inside the police van he was being transported in. The medical examiner says the wound matched the bolt in the area of the van Gray was held in. The autopsy reveals that there is no evidence that Gray hit his head on his own and also that the injuries Gray sustained were exactly like those of someone that had been in a major car accident. An unidentified prisoner in the van with Gray said he heard Gray banging himself against the walls trying to injure himself. A second detainee also came forward and said he only heard a little banging. Investigators also discovered that the van carrying Gray made a previously unknown stop while Gray was in the vehicle, and that he was not strapped into a seatbelt, according to police. It's beginning to appear that Gray may have been subjected to the police brutality tactic known as a rough ride. In a rough ride, suspects are usually handcuffed in the back of the vehicle without being secured by a seatbelt. They are then assaulted by the erratic driving of the police van driver. One sharp turn or sudden stop can do as much or more abuse than an actual physical assault. The abused prisoner is then faced with a he said, she said situation. From the New York Times, for example, in June 1980, Freddie Franklin was walking on 75th Street on the south side of Chicago with a friend when he claimed a group of police officers wrongfully arrested him, placed him in handcuffs, and forced him into the back of a police wagon. He landed face down on the floor of the vehicle. Two officers drove the van recklessly and erratically in order to throw him around the floor of the van, he claimed, in a federal lawsuit. According to court documents, by the time Mr. Franklin arrived at the police station, he lay bleeding after biting off his lower lip. The same year Mr. Franklin was injured, another handcuffed man suffered a broken neck after he fell off a bench in the back of a police van after the vehicle made a sharp turn. He won a $900,000 settlement. At least two other Baltimore men, Jeffrey Alston and Dondi Johnson, were paralyzed after police van rides in separate cases that led to lawsuits. Mr. Alston, paralyzed from the neck down, settled for $6 million in 2004. 30 plus detectives were assigned to the case. Still, there are no definitive answers. The Baltimore Police Department has now turned the investigation over to the Baltimore State's Attorney Office. If new evidence is found, we will follow it. If new direction is given by the state's attorney, we will obey it and we will follow through with the investigation. We will also further investigate at the request of the state attorney to bring forth any other witnesses that we find. 
I understand the frustration. I understand the sense of urgency. And so has the organization. And that is why we have finished it a day ahead of time. Six officers are each facing multiple charges, including manslaughter, assault, misconduct in office, and false imprisonment, the Baltimore Sun reports. Goodson, who drove the van, has been charged with second-degree murder. It may appear that justice is being served in Baltimore, but peeking under the table laid out for the American populace reveals a full-on staging of United Nations intervention. State Department Memorandum and Public Law 7277. Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. Department of State, Disarmament Series 5. Office of Public Services, Bureau of Public Affairs. In it, they have the graphs that show the U.S. military being phased out, every other world army being phased down to zero, and a giant U.N. global peacekeeper force based in The Hague taking conscripts from every country, from every district. And the United Nations said uh, on July 7, 2000, that they wanted to have the Office of Unidir, the Small Arms Disarmament Bureau, move to have the complete abolition of civilian ownership of firearms because civilian ownership of firearms threatens the legitimate power monopoly of the state. Civilian ownership of firearms threatens the legitimate power monopoly of the state. It's a very true statement except for one word, legitimate. And I said two weeks ago that you would then hear the White House and Michael Moore call for the complete disarmament of local police departments unless they go under total federal control. This is the 7277 plan. First they disarm the people, then they disarm the police, the state police, the local police, except for special paramilitary special event police that are the new Praetorian Guard. And then they serve under the UN. That's why Austin police, DC police, New York police are all in these international exchange programs. Sound reasonable on the surface but they're all being unified into one global standardized command. Meanwhile, protests are raging across the country. There have been demonstrations in Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, Denver, Houston, Minneapolis, New York, and Ferguson, Missouri. More are underway in Seattle, Portland, Oregon, and Oakland, California. John Baum, Infowars.com. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients. Tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com.
Welcome back. Now we're going to discuss the vaccine debate and how it's being filtered through your television set. Yeah, that's right. And the latest piece of ridiculous propaganda comes from Netflix's Daredevil series. And we actually wrote an article on this yesterday. Netflix's Daredevil pushes measles vaccine. Propaganda scriptwriters refer to vaccine skeptical parents as idiots. Mm -hmm. And I have a report that I did on this actually uh, yesterday. Uh, I guess I put it out late last night and uh, I actually showed the clip in there. So we're not going to show it now. I just want to go over a few things in this. So this article came out in February. Marvel Daredevil Netflix series starts production in New York this summer. Well, then they officially wrap production December 22nd, 2014. Uh, the director of the, last, uh, of the last episode put this tweet out on December 21st. And so then right after that, we find that the, here it is right here. The first measles vaccine coming out of uh, Disneyland Who's own, who owns Marvel, came out December 28th. So wow. I immediately started going, wow, they totally predicted programming. They knew this was going to happen. You know, my wheels started turning into that as well. And then I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe something was going on in like March, springtime 2014 with measles. And it turns out there was, there was a New York Times article that was talking about how measles was spreading through medical facilities Right at that time, March, I think the article date is like March 11th, 2014. So then I'm like, okay, well, the writers probably saw this and decided to write it into their script. And there's probably nothing pre-predictive programming about this, but they were referring to parents who didn't vaccinate as idiots. And then I point out there was another uh, measles outbreak in 2011 that was traced back to a young lady who was 22 years old and fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And it gets better. The Disneyland measles outbreak was traced back to an Amish person who supposedly brought it over from the Philippines. Well, I did some digging back when that was going on. And here's from the Department of Health of the Philippines. And if and I'll, I'll scroll. It's really small writing. But in 2012, there were only 92 cases in the entire country. And they say if you have uh, at least, that means you have to at least 60 true measles cases at present. Measles is said to be eliminated if there is uh, one case per million or below 100 cases in a year. So they had 92 cases in one year, and they're saying, we've eradicated measles out of the Philippines, yet this guy brought it back from the Philippines because he was staying with five people who had it in a house mm -hmm. in the Philippines. So if this vaccine is so great, how, one, how did he get it and bring it into Disneyland? And then how did it spread from there? Because there was even an LA Times article, which I'll go to in my report, which talks about how five of the people that were spreading it around and had caught it were workers at Disneyland who had been vaccinated. Right. So it's just another example of how these things really happen. Well, and that's really interesting, too, that you that you bring all this up. I didn't even realize that was going on, but I, I was covering the SB 277 vote uh, last week going on mandatory vaccinations in California. And I thought it was really interesting that the young, uh, the seven-year-old, the little boy that was being, you know, he's going through cancer treatment for his uh, childhood leukemia. And mm -hmm. he's being kind of the face of this movement, calling on uh, the politicians to, to not allow other kids to, that aren't vaccinated to come to school and harm me. And he's out there kind of being paraded. Well, it turns out that his grandfather is a consultant for GlaxoSmithKline. So, you right. know, no, nothing Conflict kind of, of sketchy there. there. Please, Absolutely. No. But also, if you go and look at their own page that they hand out to people who are going through cancer treatment, um, if you go through their documents there, they'll say, Avoid the recently vaccinated. Don't mm -hmm. hang out with people who have just recently gotten these, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, this, that, because they're live vaccines. And it specifically said that. But right, if you, they've changed those documents right about January, February. And so now that warning is no longer in their pamphlets. Well, in their pamphlets. But if you read in the actual insert, it'll say stuff like, don't give it to pregnant women. We haven't tested to see if this has reproductive harm. Yeah. Yet they, they, to have tons of vaccines now that they want to inject in pregnant Well, that's just women. great. It's like the vaccine agenda is so intense that they right. would actually remove warnings for cancer treatment. To exactly. And you have another one from Law & Order, NBC's yeah. Law & Order, that was another, and that was to even just, a more hardcore. To just show you how in extreme, they with all this behavior placement, so this was a, an, an NBC Law & Order, and the episode revolves around a measles outbreak in an elementary school due to parents that didn't vaccinate their children. Once again, with idiot parents have this whole measles outbreak when many times it's traced back to the recently vaccinated because exactly. it is a live 
Well, virus. And that process is called shedding. You shed it for up to two weeks. You shed the virus out of your body so you are contagious. Right. And it's documented. And when you're around, you know, That's little babies. That's part of the babies, science. They tell you not to look at. Yeah the, you know? the, yeah, the little babies. Now, obviously, it should be noted that when you watch television, your brain instantly go, your brain waves go into the alpha state, right. which is where you're very you're susceptible, susceptible yeah, you yeah. know. Oh, and, vaccines are bad. Oh, oh. In fact, we I'm have the parent. promo oh. clip. This promo clip is out of this world, the way they edited it. It's about uh, 25 seconds long. Let's go to that now. How do you feel? I'm fine. <coughs> Dad says I should go to school. Seven students confirmed with measles, four others possible. How? They had to have been vaccinated. These moms never vaccinated their kids and lied about it. Vaccines are harmful. You are endangering the health of every child in this city. Blue. No, it's turning blue. Call 911. All new SVU next Wednesday at 9, 8 central here on NBC. And that was just 25 to 30 seconds of just hardcore in-your-face propaganda. Imagine if you had to sit through 48 minutes of that, which is what the average length of an hour-long program is. Notice they call it program. And, and then you have all those commercials in between for exactly. all the wonderful pharmaceuticals they want to sell you. You know, because you get to prescribe yourself, just ask your doctor. But and they don't have to disclose that. that. They don't have to right. dis disclose their ties or their product placement. And I don't want to let Marvel off the hook either. Um, you know, as being part of this whole thing. They they came out, this was uh, in 2010, Marvel Comics, Captain America says, tea parties are dangerous and racist. Uh -huh. And and in this article by uh, Warner Houston, here's the actual page where uh, it talks about, <laughs> it even says it right here, I don't exactly see a black man from Harlem fitting in with a bunch of angry white folks is what Steve Rogers says to his buddy as they th have things like stop the socialists, teabag the libs before they teabag you, America for sale, no new taxes. America, not Americant, no government in my Medicare. I mean, these are just angry people signs angry at their giant bloated government that wants to suck them dry. Oh, but that's and not yet, Captain America. Yet if you don't like that, you're suddenly a racist. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like, what? If you, if, you, if you feel that way about the government. But in contrast, if you watched, as we did last night, we did a put a video out about the new Avengers. Captain America seems to be the only one on that team with like a wholesome set of morals, which exactly. is, is nice to see because I think he's putting out a good message there, mm -hmm. contrasting it with all the AI craziness that was going on in that movie. So yeah. uh, I think that about wraps up that. We're gonna go to the report that I did, um, well, I put out this morning along with the Don's article. So I encourage you to check out Netflix's Daredevil Pushes Measles Vaccine. That is a great article. It's got a lot of other sources in it that you need to check out and see how the brainwashing works on that level. Mm. And so we're gonna go to that report. And then when we come back from break, it's gonna be Dave and Knight sitting in the chair interviewing uh, a representative from an organization of nurses who are against mandatory vaccination because they are on the front lines of all this healthcare scamming that's going on, and they see what it's really all about. And then after that, we got Alex Jones. So it's a quite a packed day, uh, evening here at the InfoWars <laughs> Nightly News. Lucky you. Yeah. Hey guys, Rob Dew from InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News with uh, vaccine propaganda mass media video here. There's a quick report. I want to show you guys first a clip of a video from the new Netflix miniseries called Daredevil. And this was just recently released. Uh, it's actually a pretty popular series from the outset. It's even a little more popular than House of Cards. So this is, a lot of people are watching this. But here, let's, let's show you the clip and then we'll, I'll come back and, and we'll talk about it. And the appeal? No promises, okay? Now get the hell out of my office. I've got a measles outbreak to deal with because idiot parents don't want to vaccinate and my best nurse is out with who the hell knows what. Now get the hell out of my office. I've got a measles outbreak to deal with because idiot parents don't want to vaccinate and my best nurse is out with who the hell knows what. All right, so you see the kind of overweight healthcare worker saying she's got to deal with all these parents who don't want to, idiot parents, she calls them, who don't want to vaccinate their children during a measles outbreak. And you're saying, well, that kind of makes sense. We just had the measles outbreak in Disneyland. But wait, this is where it gets interesting. Marvel made the announcement that they were going to do the Daredevil series back in February last year. Here's an article from Marvel's website itself, Marvel's Netflix series to film in New York City. This was published February 26, 2014, well before the Disneyland measles outbreak, which happened in December of, the, of that past year. And now we go to the next article. Marvel's Daredevil officially wraps production. That came out December 22nd, 2014, and it was actually from a tweet from Stephen DeKnight that was dated 12.35 p.m. 
December 21st, 2014. Now, the state of California recently released the measles outbreak numbers from that Disneyland outbreak. Here it is. State of California measles outbreak that began in December, now over. It lists the first incidents that can be traced back to Disneyland for measles being December 28th, 2014. So I'm going to ask you this question. How can a show that was in production the summer before the Disneyland measles outbreak began be talking about idiot parents not vaccinating their children and the measles outbreak? Makes you wonder. You know, remember the Simpsons and the 9-11 magazine? And all the other instances of 9-11 that were going on in movies before. Is this a, a foreshadowing that was going on? They were trying to tell us that it was going to happen, and then it happened. Well, the measles outbreak didn't kill anyone, for one thing. And it didn't affect too many people in the end. It was sort of a bunch of hype just to get people to vaccinate their kids. It, it did cause people like Jimmy Kimmel to come out and say it. You know, you idiot parents, you stupid parents. And he made his uh, spoof skit with the doctors. There is basically no reason not to vaccinate your kids. No reason. Which is why I cannot f believe we have to make this PSA. But I actually have a, a better explanation. I don't think it was Disney who's owned by Marvel, or let's see, Disney owns Marvel. And so I don't think they put this in there and then it created the outbreak in Disneyland. That was definitely bad business for them. But let's look at a New York Times article from March 18th, 2014. And this would have been about the time that they started writing the Daredevil series. If the end of February, they're talking about it's going to film in New York. Well, by that time, they've already started probably writing a few episodes or outlining the series. And now they're into writing dialogue. So March 18th, 2014, measles outbreak may have spread in medical facilities, a New York City official says. And this was about a measles outbreak that happened in New York City. But what's interesting is this came out April 11th, 2014, measles outbreak traced to fully vaccinated patient for the first time. Get the measles vaccine and you won't get the measles or give it to anyone else, right? Well, not always. A person fully vaccinated against measles has contracted the disease and passed it on to others. The startling case study contradicts received wisdom about the vaccine and suggests that a recent swell of measles outbreaks in developed nations could mean more illnesses among the vaccinated. And this is from sciencemag.org. So this is a science, a science organization putting out this information. So when they say the science is settled and you have to have your herd immunity, you have to have 98%. Well, the Disneyland measles outbreak was traced back to a missionary worker who went to the Philippines. And I showed you in a previous video that I did that the Philippines has like a 98, 99% uh, fully vaccinated population. Okay, so they're fully vaccinated against the measles, yet this person who was in a household with five others who had the measles then brought it back to the United States. So in the end, it doesn't look like Disney and Marvel came together to make this, you know, uh, put out this propaganda foreshadowing the fact that they knew the Disneyland outbreak was going to happen. I don't believe that at all. But what I do believe is they were putting out some propaganda because it turns out that the New York uh, measles outbreak that happened at the same time the Daredevil series was being written, was started by a fully vaccinated individual. And that's why I always like to say, read the damn insert, parents, okay? Not the sheet of paper that they give you when they try to scare you into getting your vaccines. Read the actual insert of the vaccines and see what all the side effects are, all the published and unpublished data that they have out there. That is where you need to look. That's the best place to start. This has uh, been Rob Dew with InfoWars.com. PrisonPlanet.tv and InfoWars Nightly News. If you're not a member of Prison Planet TV, please consider becoming a member today. It's your subscription that helps fund all the things you see here at InfoWars and sending out the reporters. we got two reporters now out in Baltimore covering the riots. They're also in D.C. right now covering what's going on there. Uh, so it's your support that helps us do all this, and we thank you once again. If you are a member of PrisonPlanet.tv, and if you aren't and you're watching this on YouTube, go to PrisonPlanet.tv and sign up today. Thank you very much. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This is an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the ProPure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. 
Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. Yeah, it has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The ProPure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your ProPure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. Did you know that only six corporations control 90% of what millions of Americans see, hear, and read every single day? It's the illusion of choice. Think about it. The mainstream media is owned by only a handful of mega corporations with vested interests. But on the other hand, the Internet is an interconnected network of billions of sources. So you can research information for yourself from multiple sources, or you can blindly accept what you hear or read in the mainstream media, never questioning what you are being told. This gives you a false sense of reality. I mean, do you actually know what you think you know? Or have you been programmed to accept someone else's version of events? Think about it. This is Darren McBreen, and I want you to break the matrix at InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. And listen to The Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on in your mind. Joining us tonight is Michelle Routon. Now, she is a founding board member of Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines, NAMV.org. They are against mandatory vaccines for healthcare professionals. Now, she is a neonatal nurse, practitioner in multiple neonatal intensive care units with over 13 years' experience. And before we go to her, I just want to remind you of the AMA Code of Ethics. This is their opinion about informed consent, what they have to say. The patient's right of self-decision can be effectively exercised only if the patient possesses enough information to enable an informed choice. The patient should make his or her own determination about treatment. The physician's obligation is to present the medical facts accurately to the patient or to the individual responsible for the care and to make recommendations for management in accordance with good medical practice. The physician has an ethical obligation to help the patient make choices from among the therapeutic alternatives consistent with good medical practice. Informed consent is a basic policy in both ethics and law that physicians must honor. And they go on to say, unless the patient is unconscious or incapacitated. We are now throwing away our code of ethics. We are now throwing away our fundamental rights that have, as humans, that have been recognized in the Constitution, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, saying, if we don't explicitly give power to the government, then we retain that power. They're renaming our informed consent personal belief exemptions. You're not informed, you just have a personal belief. And you don't have, they don't have to get consent from us because we're merely slaves. Anything they allow us to do is an exemption. We're gonna to talk to Michelle Routon and find out what nurses have been struggling with for a very long time as this tyranny is now rolling out to the broader population. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Now, this is something, the removal of informed consent, that is kind of new to most people in the general population, but for nurses, you've been struggling with this for quite some time. Tell us about uh, Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines, uh, when that uh, started, and why you started it. Well, mandatory vaccine, um, Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines was founded um, a couple of years ago by Amy Kenyon, a nurse who wanted to fight against mandatory vaccines for employment. We really have seen this coming down the pike for, you know, five years ago. They were um, really coming after us with the forms to sign and, you know, Joint Commission is saying that we have to prove that we are offering the shot to every single little nurse mm -hmm. and, and, and healthcare worker. And so we really saw it coming down the pike and there were warnings and there were some of us saying, Hey, everybody needs to pay attention because this is coming. Um, and then to, about two years ago, there were some that started three years ago, they started with the mandatory vaccines. 
And most hospital systems in the country are requiring for all hospital staff to be vaccinated with the flu vaccine to keep their jobs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their families. And and so what we've seen in the past is that they basically bring economic pressure. Uh, Many times it's coming from the federal government against the hospitals. And then they push that uh, economic pressure to people to say, well, we strongly encourage you to do that. And then it just comes down to the fact that you're going to do this or you're going to lose your job type of thing. Now we're seeing that in the general population coming against school children and saying you're going to have these uh, vaccines or you're not going to go to school and we'll hold your parents as if you are, are truant. Or in some cases, in other countries, they are taking away people's benefits. I mean, it, it's good. And then you're just, we've got all this legislation that's being introduced across the country that we just say, you don't have a right to informed consent. Talk to people about that, because we don't even need to get into, we can talk about the efficacy, the safety, and the other issues of vaccines, but it really kind of comes down to the ethical issue of whether or not you can force people to have any kind of medical treatment. And that's a very dangerous idea. You know, even a lot of hospital personnel are very unaware there's, that there is a hospital value-based purchasing program that is requiring or wanting 90% vaccination rate of hospital personnel and threatening them with a 2% loss Exactly. Um, as a bonus in their income. And when that happens and it's the bottom line and it's about money and we have Obamacare and we have Medicare spending cut, every 2% is a very big deal to these hospital systems. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's a big deal. Now you have the people who are supposed to be providing informed consent for every single patient who walks through that door. That's our ethical obligation that we provide them with information Uh, about what it is we think they need, and they're allowed to say yes or no. But now you have an entire building full of people who have had that right taken away from them. Absolutely. First, it becomes about the mandatory, uh, about the stick, uh, the economic stick, trying to force people to have this. And then they get to the point, as they are now, to just say, forget about everything. We're just going to take away your rights as individual to have any information about your medical treatment, and we don't care if we get your consent or not. Right. And we, you know, Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines and and specifically myself on radio and everything else, I've been saying over and over again for two years, it is not just us. It's not just the nurses. You can't just say, oh, it's just the nurses. Oh, it's just the hospital staff. They will come for you next. Yes. So you're seeing that even in Texas with the teachers. They're coming after the teachers for mandatory flu vaccines on the tail end of a season or the flu shot showed 16% effectiveness. Absolutely. And we saw this case, uh, the uh, senator who introduced a a bill that would take away people's informed consent in Oregon. Her name is uh, Senator Steiner Hayward, and she is also a physician. And when they were having the hearings, there was a lawyer who basically called her out on her hypocrisy. He pointed out that even though she suffers from muscular dystrophy and she takes interferon, her physician and the drug company both told her that she should not, she should stop interferon while she was doing breastfeeding. She did her own research. She contacted people directly at universities. She felt that it was safe to continue with the interferon while she was uh, breastfeeding, and so she went against the advice of her physician, against the device, uh, the advice of the pharmaceutical company. And what he and she got very upset about that. She said, "How dare you? How dare you criticize me for that?" And he says, "I'm merely pointing out." We want to have the same freedom to make the same choices for ourselves and for our children that you had in this particular instance. It wasn't about the vaccines. It was about a particular drug, and she had a right of informed consent. She was very incensed that somebody would question her judgment about that, question her actions, and yet she would not allow people to have that same freedom in their individual lives. Yes, I I remember watching that video and just being shocked that, I mean, and it's not just her, it's an entire country full of people that cannot cross that kind of common sense into vaccines. It is such a highly polarized topic and people are so angry that we're having a hard time getting people to step back and say, hey, if they can make you do this, What is it that they can make you do next? And if they can make the nurses do it, then they can make the teachers do it. And then they can do it to all the children and they can take parental rights away. And it's just a slippery slope that keeps going. Well, we know exactly what they can do because we've seen the history of this. 
We know that at the Nuremberg trials, uh, one of the things that came out of that was the Nuremberg Code, which said that you must have informed consent in all cases, because if you don't have informed consent, eventually you're going to get down, as you point out, to this slippery slope where they start doing medical experimentation on people, heinous experiments that they did in the concentration camps that the Japanese doctors also did, justifying it in the name of the greater good of society. Anything can be justified in the name of the greater good of society. And we have to realize that society is never going to be a good society if you trample on the rights of the individuals that make up that society. That's the fundamental issue, I think. It is the fundamental issue. And um, I think that it, this, what is going on in this country right now with legislation all across the country, you know, and you said we don't even have to talk about statistics and side effects and things like that, but there's these intense conversations going on that don't even involve what is ethically correct, and it's not involving what actually is the truth. So we're spending all this time and money trying to make this group have a flu shot that was 16% effective, knowing that the Department of Justice, March 5th, 2015, for the previous quarter, settled 92 cases, and 73 of them were for flu shot injuries. Yes, and of course we have the Vaccine Court, the uh, National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, that's been around for a very long time, which takes away most of your rights if you are damaged by a pharmaceutical vaccine. People should be questioning why we have a vaccine court, why it is necessary to have that. It seems to me like they were admitting when they did it back in 1986 that they were having so many cases that they needed to uh, set up this this court that would not allow you to sue so they can continue on with vaccines. We talked at the beginning of the program how they're using financial punishment to force hospital systems to get their staff vaccinated. But of course, there is a huge financial incentive for the vaccine companies to push this when they don't have any liability. And we should all ask, why are we being forced to buy and to inject a product for which the manufacturers don't have any personal liability? That we need to ask that question, and we need to follow the dollar at all times. Yes. You know, if, if we're down, I'm down in Texas at the Capitol fighting, and it's like if I feel like I can get down there and away from my patient load for one day, that I've 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 been victorious. But you know, I walk away from there and I realize those pharmaceutical reps are there every single day, and there's a lot of them, and they throw around a lot of money. Yes, and it's yes. happening every single day, and and we need to pay attention to: uh, is this about money, or are we really talking about people and what's best for them, and what's ethically correct about who can that I can make a decision about my body for myself? Exactly. I think we are losing our fundamental human rights for the profits of the pharmaceutical companies, and the reason I say that is because look at the fact that just within the last couple of years, they announced that they were going to stop all work on antibiotics that so we're going to focus solely on vaccines. And if you look at every single kind of treatment that they're coming up for, for every possible malady or disease, they're calling everything a vaccine. And clearly they have a financial incentive to do this if there's a national vaccine court that takes away their liability. They can produce these pharmaceutical products with zero liability and then force us with a gun to our head to take their products. It's an absolutely amazing scam. This makes the bank bailouts that happened uh, the first part of the uh, you know the early 2000s, that makes that look like nothing compared to this because they're able to hold a gun to your head, force you to buy their product. If it damages you or your family, you don't have any uh, compensation from it except from a court, which is kind of an arbitration process. It's not a real uh, compensation process. Right. I mean, when you're looking at how many cases are brought and how many cases are settled, there's an inordinate amount of money that has been paid out, but percentage-wise of people that go through the trauma of doing that and stick through all the years that it takes and then finally get the money, I mean, what really could be paid out in this country is very big. Yes, um, yes. And it's just, it's deeper and it's in, more insidious than that. You know, I, I really believe that the greatest coup that's been pulled over on this country by Western medicine, backed by all this money of big pharma, and their protection and all the money they're making and throwing is the convincing of the women in this country as a whole to ignore their maternal instinct. Yes. I mean, it's deep. While we're talking about that, 
speak to the issue that now they're removing the recommendations that uh, pregnant women not get vaccinated uh, because uh, this is something that's been there for a very long time, but now they're, they're moving that ba back. So can you speak to that? Have you seen that? I can. I've seen that, you know, especially being around the NICU and being on postpartum floors and seeing what's going on. Um, I'm just absolutely dumbfounded because all you have to do is go pull the vaccine insert and they will say on there, not approved for pregnant and lactating women. Yes. Let yeah, me let me let me ask over you over and over again. Yes, absolutely. And and since you're a ne neonatal uh, nurse, uh, let me ask you uh, what your opinion is. I know we've had a lot of uh, doctors uh, saying that they believe that we're vaccinating the children too early with too many vaccines. That uh, that in and of itself has caused a lot of problems because they don't have an immune system that's developed to be effective even for this, but it also presents dangers to them with the preservatives and the adjuvants. So do you have an opinion on that? I do. Um, I think we are doing them too young. I think we are doing way too many at once if you just look at how fast the schedule has grown. But I think what a lot of people don't realize in a, in a closed space like a NICU is they've decided that we need to vaccinate these babies on time. Two months after they're born, Bam, there it goes. Mm -hmm. if this baby could be four months early and still supposed to be inside their mother and weighing three or four pounds and oh, getting the same amount of vaccine as a 200-pound man. Mm. And, and, you, and I've sat in a, in a room with all of our on-call staff, physicians and practitioners, like, oh, wow, this is so embarrassing. This 25-weeker never actually required a breathing tube and going on the vent. You know, after he was born, he was so strong. But we gave him his two-month vaccinations, and he got intubated last night. Ha, 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 oops, how embarrassing. Like, it's funny. Wow. I mean, wow. the step-down units are calling the NICU saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and give these four babies their two-month shots today. Make sure you have beds ready because we all know they're going to have increased breathing difficulty, feeding and digestion wow. difficulty, uh, apnea, you know, forgetting to breathe and bradycardia. This is what goes on. Um, and so, so the whole medical ethic of first do no harm just goes out the door so they can follow somehow, the vaccine company's schedule. Somehow it's just everybody's on this straight, they're marching the line of this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm in private practice in the clinics, you just see these kids, they are so sick and it, and they come in sick and, and, and a lot of pediatricians are giving them vaccines while they're sick even though that is a contraindication and they're just getting kicked while they're down over and over and over again. Mm. So chronic ear infections, of course, the autism rate, one in 64, who knows what the number is going to be next. Yes. Uh, eczema, you know, all sorts of just asthma, all sorts of problems going on. And we just keep towing the line. I really don't understand. And of course, uh, speak to this issue of herd mentality. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I keep calling it herd mentality because that's what it is. They talk about <laughs> herd immunity, okay? And they try to point out that, you know, they're only going to be safe if everybody gets the vaccine. That's how they scare everybody about this. But of course, as we reported at Infowars.com, we've got students at a uh, school that had a 99.5% uh, vaccination rate for whooping cough. Nevertheless, they had one child come down with it and transmitted it to uh, three more of uh, his, his uh, fifth grade peers. We had a case uh, in Canada, in Quebec, where 55, 52 of 98 uh, teens caught the measles and they had been fully vaccinated. We had a case in New York in 2011 where a twice vaccinated person uh, came down with measles and then transmitted it to four other people, two of which had uh, vaccine records that they had been vaccinated twice. The other two had antibodies indicating that they had uh, been vaccinated. So. Herd immunity isn't really going to protect anybody, is it? No, it's not. You know, that was a great theory uh, when we thought that vaccines would give lifetime immunity like natural disease. And, of mm -hmm. course, we figured out that it hasn't. So we've got all these adults walking around upset that there might be a kid out there around their kid that's not vaccinated, but they're completely uh, non-immune at this point. And it just... You know, it's virology. Viruses change. Um, they will always outsmart, I think. And, you know, everybody is upset about the measles. And we've got, what is it, Japan at a 99% vaccination rate. And they have the biggest outbreak right now. So 
Um, it's a nice theory, but I had I, on my desk the infectious diseases and in children uh, art, you know, newsletter here. And in, in the front page, unpredictability remains the one constant with seasonal influenza, admitting that yes. last year had dismal results. And at the end of it, that article, what does it say? But you all should still be making sure that every single one of your patients is vaccinated for the flu this next season. Wow. And I read it and I just go, I don't understand how all these other providers are reading this and going, okay, well, that's what it says at the end <laughs> of the article. So I'm going to do it. I, it just amazes me when I see all those flu vaccines that are being sold uh, in grocery stores and drug stores. I mean, I, I guess you can get one of them at a filling station pretty soon along with your fill up. I, when I see that, when I see the vaccine court that removes uh, their liability, when I see them taking away our informed consent, all of those things tell me that something is wrong. And of course, people can look into the medical issues, inform themselves, and then tell the government that you can't do things to us without our consent. It's very important, I think, that we all stand up and uh, resist this. But in the time that we've got left, we're nearly out of time. Tell us a little bit about your organization. If someone is a nurse and they are getting pressured uh, where they work to uh, have a mandatory vaccine. Tell us about uh, how you help people and tell us about your organization. Well, nurses think it's mandatory vaccines. We do have a website. It's www.namv.org. We also have a very um, active Facebook page with over 20,000 members. We are trying to keep people updated on what's going on legislation, um, all the studies that are coming out. We have a couple of vaccine lawyers that we work with. Um, and so we're really right now trying to provide support, provide information, especially with the nurses, letting them know, you know, you're not the only one out there dealing with having to find a medical exemption or turning in a religious exemption and wearing a mask from whatever day they say the flu starts until whatever day they say the flu magically ends, usually March 31st. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're really trying to round people up. And I was very impressed with the teachers this week in Texas. Um, they came out in full force and we're thinking that bill's going to fizzle because there was such just animosity against that bill. And so really just to support nurses and standing up for themselves, I think there's a lot of fear about how am I going to provide for my family? There's a lot of nurses that are the sole providers for their households. And so mm -hmm. that's really what we're up against. Yes, yes. That's, that's a really underhanded thing to do to people. Thank you so much, Michelle Routon. And of course, nurses have been on the front line of medical care. And now you're on the front line fighting medical tyranny. I really appreciate you doing that. And the website again is namv.org. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I'll just close the program with a quote from one of our founders, Benjamin Rush, who warned us about medical tyranny. He said, unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an undercover dictatorship to res restrict the art of healing to one class of men, or as we understand it, to one gigantic industry that owns the government and thinks that they own you, the pharmaceutical companies. If you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe there, it's free. But we hope that you will subscribe to Prison Planet TV and support us financially. If you do, you'll be able to get the news as it happens each Monday through Friday at 7 Central, and you can share that with up to 20 other individuals simultaneously, as well as having access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Stay with us, though. Right after the break, we have a special report from Alex Jones on Jade Helm. We'll be right back. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans 
Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best and an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. And finally tonight, here at InfoWars Nightly News, I want to talk about some big developments concerning Jade Helm. You know, they've had thousands of news publications and national television networks attack InfoWars.com in the last few month or so dealing with this because they want to try to discredit the idea that we have militarized police, that we're losing our basic liberties, that the NSA is spying on us, and that the federal government has a desire to fully federalize the country. The problem is all over Texas, people by the hundreds are showing up at their city councils and county commissioners' offices, like we saw earlier this week in Bastrop, Texas, and saying, no, we understand what's happening. The TSA, founded 14 years ago, is now running checkpoints all over the United States and searching people violating their Fourth Amendment at train stations and on highways. The Army is involved all over the country, and the Marines running DWI checkpoints. Posse comitatus is basically gone. The NSA is openly spying on people. And every day, we see videos, like the one out of West Jordan, Utah, where they bust in a man's house without a warrant and then release a police dog on him, and it basically chews his face off, tears his lip off. We're going to show that graphic footage right now. Stand up slowly and come out to us. Bust. Bust. On the ground now. On the ground. On the ground now. On your stomach. On your stomach. Now, on the other end of this spectrum, we have George Soros, the White House, the Justice Department, trying to blame all these problems on local police when it's the feds with the training and with the equipment that have basically pushed this change in culture. Who's going to have oversight over the feds blowing up Waco or Ruby Ridge or financing terrorist groups like al-Qaeda to take over Syria? The feds are not in a position to police the police because they're the authors and the progenitors and the pushers whose signature is all over what's happening today. The truth is the Army's involved in domestic psyops against the people. The truth is Jade Helm is meant to be a domestic takeover drill. The media has tried to deceive people into saying that we believe it's an imminent takeover. No, the takeover already happened by the private Federal Reserve in 1913. And it's just been expanding its control, using America to be the muscle for a planetary empire for a long time. And people are sick of it, but not just here all over the world, we're seeing this. And there's some good news. Uh, Victoria and other cities, uh, several are listed here, have backed out of drills with the U.S. military. They understand what's happening. Uh, they're aware of what's going on. And this is happening in other cities as well. People understand. And the militaries begin to back off some of their earlier claims uh, that were in their own manuals. 
Let's be clear. We don't think the military is the enemy. We're against the globalists turning it into a domestic police force that Obama has talked about so much. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. So the truth is, humanity's waking up and no amount of ridicule from thousands of publications or CBS Nightly News will shut down that information getting out. InfoWars has a real history of being modern Paul Revere's ringing the alarm bell that the globalists are coming, that the globalists have hijacked our nation and are occupying it and bankrupting it. And Americans of all race, colors, and creeds, military, police, and, quote, civilian, are beginning to understand that. Let's not let them trick us into having a civil war. That's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Never forget, if you're watching this transmission, you are the resistance. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. When it comes to you and your family's health, InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of Silver Bullet Colloidal Silver, exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting-edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high-quality Silver Bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your Silver Bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.